Good morning, everybody. Good morning, church. How's everyone today? Are we good? Yeah, let's get a little energy because this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice, not be sad. We will rejoice and be glad in it. So good morning, everyone. All right, so turn your attention to the screens. We've got some announcements today. So first, we'll talk about the retreats. And yes, I did plug this a bit last week, and I'm going to do it again because registration deadline is this Wednesday for the men's retreat. And the women's retreat is going to be the week after. So you got short time. If you're planning on going, sign up. Super easy. QR codes. You can even do it right now. It's that easy. Use your camera. Kind of zoom in on that. You can do it right now. So I do believe there's a couple groups of people 
that haven't signed up yet. One, people that have legitimate excuses, like you're moving to Switzerland in the next week. That's, that's valid, right? There's others that haven't signed up, but keep saying you're going to. Just do it, right? You have three days. Please do it. It helps with the numbers. And then lastly, there's some, honestly, I think that maybe you don't prioritize this type of getaway. Maybe it's you like to sleep in your own bed. You don't like other people. I don't know what it is. But maybe it's not a priority. I would like to challenge you, right? It is 24 hours. That is less time than the average TV watching in a week. Less time than the average social media usage in a week. 24 hours for your spiritual kind of refresh. 24 hours in a year, right? So just challenge you. If, that, if, that, if you kind of fall into that category, maybe, maybe, you know, step out of your comfort zone, try something new, and sign up before Wednesday. All right, and next announcement is student nights, so 6.30 to 8 every week. Tonight is nug night, so all the different chicken nuggets you could find in the Pittsburgh area will be there, and we'll test them all and see which one wins. Um, but yeah, $5 for that. The students also have a retreat coming up, so the res registration for that is live, so please do so there. And then lastly is the annual congregation meeting. That is coming up November 24th. That'll be a brunch and meeting after downstairs after the service. And also there's these little forums, they're leadership suggestions. So if you like wanna nominate a friend you think might be good in leadership, do so, right? That, that's what these forums are for. You could nominate them for elder, deacon, trustee, or you could make up positions. We, we'll, we'll take anything, right? And I think that is it. So if you could stand, we'll continue to worship. Thanks. Never said it would be easy. Never said there'd be no pain. But you promised you'd go with me. Your promises you always do. I confess how much I need you. I confess that I am weak. I can promise I won't fail you, but your promises will not fail me. When I'm in the valley, I will fear no evil. When you surround me, you prepare a table. Surely.
Your mercies are new over and over. 
we just thank you for this time of worship, God, that we can leave all of the all of the world at your feet, God. We just now prepare our hearts for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Good morning, everyone, uh, one and all. Uh, whether you're joining us here in person, joining us online, Sunday morning in real time, Sunday evening, Tuesday, 3 a.m., whatever it is, glad that you could join us. We started a new message series last week. We're calling Fix Your Eyes. Um, of course, that can mean, like, adjust your perspective, check your motivation, change your attitude, or in blunt terms, you're seeing it wrong. Get it right. But it can also mean keeping our gaze, like, fixed, firmly zeroed in on an immovable anchor point, one that we dare not lose sight of lest we drift off course. And that's kind of what we're, what we're aiming to talk about over these, these next few weeks together as we're going we're gonna to build, build around some scriptures that, that remind us about perspectives and priorities. Like where the Apostle Paul writes to some distracted Christians in the city of Corinth, he says, So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Or a related passage in the book of Hebrews, which is a New Testament book that was written to some very discouraged and road-weary Christians. In its 12th chapter, we read this. <clears throat> Let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. I believe through this important national season that we're not only in, but we're certainly coming up on, where we find ourselves in like a, a culture war that's overrun with division and, and power struggles and fact-bending and political egomania, we want to be able to have the discipline and the wisdom as followers of Christ to be engaged, to be hearers and tellers of truth without losing sight of what's most important, what truly anchors and rudders us. So therefore, we're going to be very purposeful over these bunch of weeks to fix our eyes on Jesus, to let his life and words be our vision not the million other things trying to be our vision. Because there's no shortage of voices out there trying to define for us who Jesus is, trying to convince us what he stood for, or use him as a rubber stamp for their cause. As we said last week, Jesus' name gets thrown behind things that look nothing like the Jesus of the Bible. So as followers of Jesus, as people committed to his truth, we need to strip away all these ways that we see Jesus thrown around for marketing ploys and political leverage to see who he really is. Not Jesus as we wish him to be. Not, not Jesus as those in power wish to convey him to be. But fixing our eyes on the real Jesus of the Bible and align ourselves with his way of living instead of trying to make him fit ours. We need to recalibrate to check our perspective, to fix our eyes. So we're spending this series listening to Jesus himself tell us who he really is, to let his life and his words speak, and to fix our gaze there so that we don't grow weary and lose heart. I used this illustration last week, and I want to say it again because I think it captures this kind of message idea so well. There's an international standard for how countries train federal agents to detect counterfeit currency. Black market counterfeit rings pose a serious threat to any nation's economic balance, so most developed nations have a way that their agents are trained to detect counterfeit bills, and it really doesn't have anything to do with keeping track of all the ways the bad guys are doing their dirty work. It's not about studying all the counterfeit variations. No, counterfeit detection training is really only about one laser-focused idea, which is rigorously studying the real thing putting so much intentional focus on the real thing that you can spot a counterfeit in a second. That's what we are after together when it comes to knowing the real Jesus. To study him, to apprentice under him, to live in his way so completely and so purposefully and so relentlessly 
that we can spot a counterfeit in a second. Last week, we started the series looking at a verse in John's gospel where Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. If you missed that message, I encourage you to hop online and give that a listen. But that verse, that claim, look at how that's phrased. Because it's actually a statement of identity. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Jesus does this several times through the book of John, and we're going to see it in today's text as well. But I want you to see where this comes from because it's important. Rewind way back. Moses is one of the foundational faith fathers in the Old Testament. He was a leader of God's people in Israel through some of their most monumental faith-shaping seasons. And there's this pivotal scene in Exodus chapter 3 where Moses encounters God as a burning bush. And God tells Moses, I'm sending you to Pharaoh, the ruler of Egypt, the most powerful man in the world. And you're going to tell him that those Israelites he has had enslaved, being free labor for him for 400 years, that he's going to set them free. Moses has lots of questions um, to God after hearing that. But one of them is basically this. Moses says, "But, but if I'm asked who sent me? If I'm asked exactly whose bold message it is I'm delivering, who should I say sent me? Look at the reply from God in Exodus 3.14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. That's, a, that's, a, that's the identity. That's the name. I am. I, I'm awful with names, which really stinks because names are kind of foundational for a meaningful relationship. Can you imagine me telling you about some amazing person that I've spent time with who has been really instrumental in shaping my life, but I can't remember their name? That would be ridiculous. Names are important. Several times in the Gospels, Jesus takes this statement from God, the statement of identity, this I am, and Jesus attaches it to himself. We talked about how inflammatory that was to Jesus' first century audience last week. Because when Jesus said, I am the light of the world, he's revealing himself to be God in their midst. The God whose light they were celebrating. The God who delivered them from from the Egyptians. He's saying, I am the I am. That's who, it's me. And that was incredibly scandalous. We saw that last week. We're going to see some more of that today, and even a few other times in this series. And I say that because I want us to be sure and remember through all of the things that Jesus says about himself, the foundational underpinning of all of it is that Jesus is God in the flesh. Jesus reveals the truth to us about who God is, a human example of God's character and presence. That's now through thanksgiving next six, seven weeks, whatever it is, we are going to suspend who we think Jesus is or who our fears tell us Jesus is, what culture or our friends tell us Jesus is, and allow Jesus to reintroduce himself to us personally as God in the flesh and then tell us what it means to be in a relationship with him. This morning we're going to be parked in John chapter 6, whether you want to use your Bibles, your Bible apps, or just follow along on the screen. We're going to look at something that Jesus told us about himself right after he finished feeding the 5,000 through miraculous means. Maybe you've heard the story, whether it's one you're very familiar with or one you just remember from VBS 30 years ago, whatever it is. Jesus had just fed 5,000. And then he withdraws to spend some time alone. But the crowds found him anyway, and now he's starting to interact with them. I want us to read the whole section, and then we'll spend some time kind of parsing it apart. Picking up, starting in John chapter 6. You are looking for me, this is Jesus talking. You are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, what sign then will you give us that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. 
Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. That's our hinge point today. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. So that's the I am identifier we're on this morning. Jesus referring to himself as the bread of life. And in so doing, he tells that crowd, he tells his disciples, and he tells you and I today what it means to be in a relationship with him, what it means to really know him. I want to pull a few important things about that, about Jesus' words in this passage this morning and what it means for him to be the bread of life. And here's the first point I want to pull out and spend some time on together. Jesus came not simply to give us bread, but to be bread. Jesus came not simply to give us bread, but to be bread. Of course, Jesus is a provider. God provides for us. We think of that when we think of bread. But remember here, Jesus had just fed 5,000 people, specifically, as history would tell us, 5,000 men plus women and children, as only men would have been counted, culturally speaking. This huge crowd has been gathered listening to Jesus teach. They're hungry, and Jesus manages to fill everyone's belly by multiplying bread and fish from one young dude's lunch bag with a bunch of food left over. So you can imagine, after experiencing that, the crowd's eager to find Jesus again the next day. But quick pause here, and this is a testimony to Jesus' laser focus on his mission, like we started to talk about last week. See, preachers tend to love crowds. There's a whole empire of celebrity pastors pulling in eyebrow-raising salaries at stadium-sized churches that are built on this wow factor of the intoxicating gr drug of popularity and crowd sizes. It's, it's a human power and ego thing. We've all heard plenty of bragging about crowd sizes from political rally coverage. Speaking of which, completely unrelated to our message, is anyone else ready for normal commercials on television? My goodness. Anyway, the, the allure of crowd sizes is an easy carrot to dangle for many people, but not Jesus. Not Jesus. Jesus sees these crowds coming after him, and his response isn't to post online about how amazing and powerful he is. How influential he is and how much people love him. Nope. Jesus' first reaction to the crowds running after him is rebuke. That's a way to kill a room, right? He says, you're not here for me. You're here because of what I did for you yesterday. You're here because I scratched an itch. You're here because the bread that made your life more comfortable and because you think miracles can be your next lottery ticket. That's why you're here. Jesus knew he was sent to live out God's truth written in Deuteronomy chapter 8, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. This is why Jesus knew his identity and his mission was not primarily to give bread, but to be bread. Let me open that up just a little bit. See, one of the great temptations that's before us is to treat God treat Jesus as a means to an end rather than the end himself. In some ways, it's that chilling verse we read last week where Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? Jesus knows the deception in this temptation because he knows as the bread of life, there will, he will only be able to satisfy you if you treat him as the end, not the means to the end. Meaning, Jesus is truth, not just a helpful map to, to show us some pointers along the way to discover our own truth. No. Jesus is the source of true life, not simply a stepping stone to help us find true life. Jesus is what sustains us and what we lean our lives against, not just a helpful barista who gets us our cosmic coffee when we need a boost. Jesus did not come simply to give bread but to be bread. Now, of course, there's, there's some tension in this because Jesus does tell us to ask him for things, 
to seek him for help and guidance. When Jesus taught his disciples how to pray in both Matthew 6 and in Luke 10, Jesus includes a line that says, give us this day our daily bread. For us, he invites us to pray that. God wants us to come to him with our needs and our hardships and our struggles. God gives you desires in your heart and he wants you to seek him like any loving parent would want from a child. But we, we too often pervert that and end up treating Jesus as like a, like a resource instead of as the source. Jesus becomes our favorite vending machine to get us the things we want. And if he doesn't deliver, we threaten to take our business elsewhere. Honestly, even in this passage, what you see later on in the story is that a number of Jesus' followers left him as a result of some of the things he says. Left him for the same reason that you and I are tempted to walk away from a faith commitment. Because Jesus didn't give them what they want, when they wanted, the way they wanted it. The great temptation every single one of us has is to treat Jesus as only a giver of bread instead of as the very bread of life. I've heard this idea uh, mentioned by other pastors and authors, this idea that when it comes to faith, we'd fare much better being historians than detectives. The idea here is, that, is a detective tries to determine motive, tries to figure out who done it, but a historian searches the records of what has already happened, what has been empirically established, and then they present a report of those findings to make a, con a compelling argument. And so for many of us, the nature of our faith is we're trying to be detectives. We're trying to figure out why God is doing what he's doing, trying to figure out how he operates his business model. But we'd make much better historians to look back on the cross, to look back on what God has done for his people through history as evidence of his love for us in the future. So observation one, Je Jesus didn't come into the world to give bread, but to be bread. Here's our second observation this morning. Jesus is different from other breads. Something to keep in mind here as we move through this, this little bit. In biblical times, bread was an absolute staple. Many facets of life depended on it. Even the Hebrew word most often translated as bread in the Bible was a word that not, not only meant the actual bread that you, that you eat, but meant food or sustenance in general. It didn't just mean something baked with flour and yeast. It could just be a word used as sustenance nourishment. So bread, both the word and the actual product, was synonymous with life and sustenance. And Jesus uses this illustration to communicate to us about what really nourishes and sustains us, what truly can address our soul hunger. He says he's different than all the other kinds of sustenance. When he says in verse 27, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to e eternal life. That's what he's talking about. I'm different. I had a friend in college. He was a, he was a bit of a character. Uh, he had the late night munchies one night, and he, he bought a box of ginger snaps from the local 7-Eleven. He loved those things, the classic crunchy ginger snap cookie, right? Apparently, though, the box that he bought was not the traditional crunchy ones. They were soft and chewy. That was how they were made, I guess. And he was disgusted after taking one bite of the first one. He just set the box over on his dorm desk and, and, and left it open. That was it. Didn't want another one. But eventually the cookies started to get stale. And so what do soft cookies do when they get stale? They get stiff. So after like five days, he, he bumped the box and could hear that they were crispy in there. He's like, oh, I'm going to try one. So he tried one. He got all excited and he ate a whole bunch because now they were, they were crunchy cookies. But he decided to keep the box open and it became kind of a science experiment of sorts. Five days later, they were stale again, which meant they were now back to being soft he kept this going to see how many cycles they would go through, and it got pretty gross, just being honest here. They got re-soft and re-hard several times, but I guess their taste kept deteriorating. Big surprise. I remember, I remember this was pretty gross. He said by like the fourth or fifth cycle through, he felt like he was just tasting the dirty laundry in his room. That's just disgusting. That's disgusting. But that's college, right? When Jesus says, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, he isn't only talking about loaves of bread getting stale or milk turning sour. He's equally referring to anything that we might seek out to satisfy us or sustain us or bring us fulfillment and meaning 
that's temporary, that's going to perish, because he knows only he can bring that. When we put our energies and our passions and pursuits into any bread that perishes, we miss the kind of life Jesus came to help us discover. Um, Back in the Old Testament, when God provided manna for the children of Israel, they're referring to that in the text that we read, right? They're wandering in the wilderness for many years. They were only allowed to take manna for one day. They couldn't store it up because after a day it would go bad. God was building an incredible illustration into that. Rely on me. Don't store up the food that perishes. Jesus' audience here would have called that story, that memory from their ancestors, they would have called that to mind immediately hearing Jesus talk. Jesus is saying that that there are things in your life that might look promising. They look like they will fill you up, but don't store them up. Eventually, they'll go south, and you'll have to find more, and it might very well mess you up along the way. What are some false breads you've been feasting on? That's kind of our question, right? False breads you've been using as your motivation, maybe even letting drive your priorities and your appetites. What are those food that spoils that you've been letting drive you? Maybe it's, I don't know, maybe it's having the right image, making sure you're seen the way you want to be seen. That can take shape in a whole bunch of ways, right? Image might be one of the biggest idols worshipped today. We run the temptation of drifting from who and what God calls us to be and to do in Christ, and we define ourselves instead according to our social media engagement or our position at work or our skills and achievements or or our LinkedIn profile or we're shaping our identity through our kids and their performance, which psychologists and sociologists warn us is destroying our kids in the process, our career success, our clothes, whatever it is, it's a form of a prison. It's it's eating wet napkins instead of a ribeye steak. If you're relying on your, don't ask me how I know that. If if you're relying on your image to fill and satisfy, then every day you're going to be in the courtroom of other people's feelings and opinions for validation that day. God knows that's fleeting. It's temporary and it'll mess you up. That's a bread that might feel fulfilling for a fleeting moment. But man, it does awful things when it doesn't go your way. Uh, For others, your false bread maybe is the pursuit of money, money that promised you security and significance, and and you're daydreaming about if you were to have this raise or this job, then you'd finally feel significant and fulfilled and get to be who you want to be. The problem is, with, with thinking of money this way, it's something we've all felt before. When you make a little bit, you immediately become dissatisfied with it. The only thing your appetite knows is the lie of more. May, and maybe this is true of you. Every time in my life that I've made a little more money, I've spent a little more money. Amazing how that works, isn't it? It doesn't matter how much or how little you make, you can fall prey to this. Letting the pursuit of more money, more stuff as what fills and satisfies you, it's always empty calories. Always, always, always. Image, money. For others, maybe it's comfort and pleasure. Maybe it's learning and education. Maybe it's power and influence. Read Ecclesiastes where King Solomon tried every single one of those to excess and found everything to be empty calories. And into that human experience, Jesus says, don't work for that. Don't lean your life against that. Don't work for the bread that spoils, but for the bread that lasts. I am that bread. I am the bread of life. All right, so number one was Jesus didn't come to simply give bread but to be bread. Number two is that Jesus is different from all the other breads, the breads that spoil. Here's the last point about Jesus as the bread of life. Jesus wants to be consumed. This is a big one that we need to understand. Look, I I don't want to be misunderstood or, or, or for this to sound discourteous, saying Jesus wants to be consumed. But this is just real stuff, and I think you're gonna see that. Look, Ain't nobody getting filled up and satisfied on the smell of bread baking in the oven, okay? If I were to hold a warm, freshly baked, I don't know, bacon parmesan focaccia from Breadworks, for example, right in front of you, and and I slowly pulled it apart so you could not only smell it, but see the glutinous goodness as it pulled apart. The only reason any of that would be appealing to you is if you actually got to put some of it in your mouth and eat it. Bread is useless as something to just look at 
or talk about or write instruction manuals about. Bread is meant to be consumed. Just like cars are meant for driving and clothes are for wearing and coffee is for drinking, black of course, food is only satisfying if you eat it. You can be surrounded by it, but unless you bring it into your very self, it is of no value to you. As the bread of life, Jesus wants to be consumed. We struggle with this. We really do. It's something that I talk about regularly around here. Our culture has a tendency to turn following Jesus and believing in him into an intellectual training exercise, where following Jesus basically just becomes an intellectual ascent into a series of beliefs and creeds. We reason that as long as we agree to some set of beliefs, we've punched our heaven ticket and all is well. But that is not at all what Jesus calls us to when he says, I am the bread of life. Jesus is bread. He is sustenance that gives us life. So we need to consume him. Meaning, meaning you take his life into your life. You live, you act, you make decisions shaped by him, defined by him. You actually build your life on his words and his truth. Your life is changed. That doesn't happen through just an intellectual exercise. It's the passage we read a few weeks ago where Jesus says in Matthew 7, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. And I'm telling you this morning, as we go through these coming months, we need to have our foundation on the rock. The rock is not your political news feeds. The rock is Jesus. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I want to be consumed. I want you to take my words in. I want you to turn away from your will, and I want you to step into mine so you can build your foundation on that rock. The only way that Jesus can satisfy, can nourish us, is if we actually allow him to transform our lives, to follow him and to walk in his ways, to trust him more than you trust yourself. Many times we don't get to experience that because we're not consuming him. We're not taking his life into our life. We're just gathering information about him that makes us feel good. Believing in Jesus, the way he says in 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 that passage, the bread of life that came down from heaven, it's believing in him who was sent. Believing in Jesus means I depend on his wisdom, not my own. That I depend on his strength, not my own. That I depend on his timing, not my own. That I'm fully depending on his righteousness and not my own. That's what it means for Jesus as the bread of life to be consumed. It's why we can even read back in the Old Testament to the Psalms and read, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste here is common Hebrew language for coming to know through personal experience. It's an invitation. Come experience the Lord's goodness. Taste for yourself a sustenance that is not determined by what is physically measurable and attainable. That's the backdrop into which Jesus says, like last week, it's me. I'm God's very presence in your midst. Taste and see. I'm the bread of life. So back to our text. You got to see this. After Jesus says, don't work for the bread that spoils, the bread that won't last, look how the people respond. Then they asked him, What must we do to do the works God requires? This this is us in 2024. Jesus calls us out on where we're seeking fulfillment, where we place our security, what we're using to satisfy, and we basically say back to him, okay, tell us what we need to accomplish. Tell us what box to check off, Jesus. Tell us what work to do so we can achieve, we can get to where you're talking about. Jesus' response is clear and simple. The work of God is this to believe in the one he has sent. That's what we just said. Believe is not the intellectual thing. It's a life shaped by his ways. In this simple answer, Jesus is again telling them, this isn't about your work or your striving. 
It's about believing in me. I'm the light of the world. I'm the bread of life. I am God in your midst and in the flesh. I am the one he has sent. Believe in me. He's almost like hitting his head against a board by this point. And their response is is a bit mind-numbing. In the next verse, they say, What sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? I imagine Jesus being like, Guys, you just watched me. The loaves, the fishes, feeding thousands. You, you were there. It's literally the whole reason you just followed me around the lake. What sign will I give you? They start, ta- they start talking about how Moses gave them the sign of manna in the wilderness like we just talked about. And Jesus cuts in. Guys, Moses didn't give you that bread. God did. And now that bread is here. Jesus says, the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. It's like, don't you, you really don't get this, do you? It's kind of what I imagine Jesus talking like. And their response, their response to that. This is so revealing about all of our hearts and our tendency to keep chasing sustenance in the temporary. They say, sir, always give us this bread. They're still thinking about the multiplied bread they just ate. Life-giving God bread. That sounds like some really good stuff. Don't stop bringing us this bread. They're those punks at the Fazoli's off the Ohio Turnpike that never order entrees but just keep telling the server to bring them baskets of free bread. Never did that on the youth group days, by the way. Never, never did that. Jesus finally lays out as clearly as he can because they, his audience, and we, have such a hard time grasping this generation's deep historical meaning that God had been communicating to them all along. Very next verse. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And as he's wrapping up his whole teaching, several verses later, he says this. Just as the living Father sent me, And I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus explains everything to them. How God's kingdom and message and promise was never confined by physical barriers or about physical bread. But but he's pointing to what is lasting, what is eternally significant. Our souls, our spiritual flourishing, our hearts are what he's after, not our physical comfort or our betterment and our optimization. No, Jesus says it's me. It's knowing me and living in a relationship with me and letting my mission and my presence sustain you. I am the bread of life. We're going to close our time this morning by taking communion. You see, Jesus did this with his disciples regularly. It was very much a cultural practice, but Jesus took that cultural practice and he used it in a very personal way to illustrate his mission to his followers. At the onset of the Last Supper, the time when he gathered intimately with them for the last time before he was crucified, Jesus gives them a powerful ceremony that illustrates just how deep his I am the bread of life thing really goes. Paul is reciting the gospel accounts when he writes in 1 Corinthians, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when, when Jesus did that and said that, the disciples may have connected the dots from his teaching in John chapter 6, where we've been today, Remembering when Jesus had told them, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the light of life of the world. Paul continues in 1 Corinthians. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. As we take communion together this morning, let's allow our hearts to to really be there. To be centered not just on the cross as an object of suffering and sacrifice, 
but on Jesus, the bread of life, sent from heaven, a bread that can sustain us and bring us real life when we consume it, when we allow Jesus' character and presence, Jesus' life to come into our lives, to redefine us, where we are crucified to old self, crucified to sin and shame, and it's now Christ who instead lives in us. Bread and juice, rich symbols of Jesus' body and blood. It was, it was packets you got on the resource table as you came in. If you didn't, there's extras in the pews. This is for those of us that have named Christ as our Lord and Savior. If you've not done that, if you're still exploring, just use this time for personal reflection. But if you call Jesus your Lord, let's remember everything we talked about. Know the richness where this comes from. And maybe even imagine that we're sitting there with the disciples hearing this for the first time, with all the language about Jesus as the bread of life that came down from heaven, all of that. Let's pray and then we'll take communion together. God, thank you for the life that you lived, for the words that you spoke, for giving us that picture of God's presence and character in the flesh. And God, this morning, as we seek to remember you, to commemorate you as the bread of life, that bread that was ultimately given so that we might have lasting life, God, I pray that you would work in our hearts and, and open us up to, to just how far-reaching that truth goes. Encourage us, convict us, all those things that only your Spirit can do within us. Ways that we've been feasting on the wrong breads, ways that we've made you an intellectual ascent system, ways that we have not consumed you. God, we are weak. We need you as the bread of life to sustain us. Thank you for the cross that we can look at once and for all as where that bread was broken for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take communion.
You know, it's, it's easy enough to, to sing, Lord, I need you, every hour I need you, but it's a whole different thing to live that way, to actually live every hour depending on, on the bread of Jesus' presence, of his life being lived out in us. So as I asked earlier in the message, what bread have you been seeking for sustenance and meaning every hour, every day? What bread does, does your actual life, meaning your decisions and your priorities and pursuits, what bread do those things show you're consuming and seeking for nourishment? I'd love to visit with you about any steps or decisions that God might have gotten your attention about this morning, ways he's nudging you into some step of obedience in his direction. In fact, let me offer you just a couple of tangible things. If you've heard about Jesus Maybe you've even respect and loved and wanted to follow Jesus, but you've never taken him as the bread of life, never surrendered your will to his, your strength to his, your righteousness to his, as we said, never consumed his life as your life. Maybe today is the day you're willing to mark that line in the sand, to name him Lord of your life, not in words and intellectual assent, but in action. We can have a conversation about baptism where our sin and our self-righteousness are buried along with Jesus underwater. And we raise up in new life, new identity in Christ alone, relying on him as the bread that sustains instead of ourself and our strivings. Maybe that's your step this morning. Or maybe, maybe it's a step recognizing you've been saying, Lord, Lord, with your lips, but your life has not been reflecting that. You've been seeking meaning and sustenance and bread that spoils instead of from the bread of life. And you want to own that. You want to confess that. You want to take a step back in the direction you know you need to be headed. Maybe that's your step this morning. Maybe much more practically speaking, maybe you, you've done all those things. Jesus is your bread of life. You've been coming to this church for a while, but you've never marked a, a very different kind of a line in the sand. You've never placed membership to say, this is my church. Our 2025 leadership discussions are in, their work, in the works. Um, Bob mentioned the annual meeting coming up next month. And there's recommendation forms on the resource table you can fill out. But at our annual meeting that we gather to affirm our leaders and next year's budget and celebrate what 2024 has been about, by necessity, that's stuff that connects with membership. Now, I understand membership can be a sticking point for some people. Some churches turn membership into a series of classes and hoops you jump through in order to be counted worthy of being a member. That's definitely not us. But then other churches have no kind of membership whatsoever. They handle all their legal and organizational structure stuff behind closed doors. We're not really that either. We aim to be simple and transparent, where anyone who has named, their, named Christ as their Lord and been obedient in the New Testament example of baptism can become a member by just expressing their desire to do so to myself, to any leader here at the church. It's a way that we know who we are reliably connected with, who has a vested interest in supporting and helping us be the church we believe God calls us to be. So if that's you and you've never done that, see me after church. I'll be in the lobby. Whether those are a thousand other different ways we can step forward in faith, I'll be out there. I would love to talk with you, to pray with you about any of these things. You can even just mark something on your Connect card if you need to head out, and I will be in touch this week. All right? Thanks so much for, for coming, the, coming this morning. Guys, register for the retreat. No more fence sitting. Let's stand and close in a final song. But the way to life begins to fall On the name of Jesus I will call For I know my God is in control And His purpose is unshakable Doesn't matter what I feel, doesn't matter what I see, my hope will always be in your promises to me. Now you're casting out all fear, for your love is setting me free. My hope will always be in your promises to me.